CityCast from Explicity. If you look at a sample group of precocious youth who have been exposed to a sport around the same time and have worked equally hard, there is no cogent explanation for the difference in their results other than the superior competence of a few in a certain domain or skill set of what we call aptitude. Talent makes itself seen. You can tell from the feverish pace at which some pick up a certain subject while others take much longer to wrap their heads around it before hard work takes over. Quite often, we come across two players who have spent their entire lives playing a sport and have risen through the ranks. For one of them, success flows easily, almost effortlessly, while the other may have a more labored progress. But when the latter hits a bend and begins to play well, I don't ascribe the turnaround to discipline alone. I believe they're actually tapping into a pre-existing resource. In general though, a person who's working hard and doing all the right things will invariably pull ahead of someone who's maybe talented but is not putting in as much effort. History posits the brilliance of Bobby Fischer as an example. Fischer learned to play chess after his younger sister brought a chess set home from a candy store. By age 14, he won the US championship and a year later became the youngest grandmaster in the world. Did he possess talent? Undoubtedly. He was obsessed with chess and something about the game clicked in his head in a way that it didn't for anyone else. But can his success be ascribed to talent alone? I don't think so. He worked incredibly hard at driving his love for chess to achieve results. Fischer took time off from playing in competitions to study games of the 19th century greats and to learn Russian, an ability he then employed to read innumerable Russian chess magazines and books. In the Soviet-run chess ecosystem of his time, mastering their tongue and teachings was a clever move indeed. It also spoke of Fischer's commitment to winning and the incredible effort he put into achieving what he did. I suppose I should speak for myself here. Playing chess came naturally to me from a very young age and I had an aptitude for it. In fact, my aptitude might explain why I was attracted to the game in the first place. It's when something intuitively makes sense to you and immediately grabs your attention. It comes at you leaping and lunging and lodges itself in your mind. Growing up, I was fascinated by the genius of the mathematician Srinivasa Ramanujam. I received his biography, The Man Who Knew Infinity, as a gift, and I was enthralled by his story. This was a boy who with no formal training in mathematics, strummed up analysis and conclusions his peers at hallowed foreign universities hadn't and went on to have a profound and extraordinary impact on the subject. I recall reading about our common roots. Both of us belonged to the southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu. His family was from Kumbakonam and mine from Mailadudurai, then Mayavaram, less than 40 kilometers apart. And how he would make notes on his observations in the dim light of a flickering lamp with no access to mathematics books. I somehow found his story relatable, possibly because I was largely self-taught in the sport I played, far removed from the fulcrum of chess learning, the Soviet Union. Chess is a finite game with finite variables, but yet phrases like infinite possibilities and unpredictable outcome seem completely appropriate while discussing chess. So it begs the question, how finite is finite? Finite can be a very large number, so large that it may as well be infinite. For instance, they have calculated that the number of possibilities of moves and resulting positions in the first 10 moves of a chess game is a 14-digit number. It's called the Shannon number, and the number is 69,352,859,712,417 possibilities. Yes, that's finite, but not a finite thing for some people. I can't count that high myself. And then they say chess is the only game in the world without an element of chance. There's no wind factor, no pitch whose inconsistencies make a ball wobble, no noisy enchanting spectators, no rain, no complaining about being dealt a poor hand. There are two players, and only they are responsible for their outcomes. But far from chess being something that can only be handled by robots, the most important variable in chess is the human variable. 
But with humans, all variables don't have to be outside variables. Often, we turn inwards. And then chess becomes a game where strategies go beyond the book. My guest today, Vishwanathan Anand, is all about a passion for chess. He is a grandmaster, world champion, several times over. He is the author of Mind Master, Winning Lessons from a Champion's Life. There's information about Anand and the book in the podcast description. But in short, Anand is a super grandmaster of the game and was reigning world champion for years, until he recently handed the crown to Magnus Carlsen. At that level of the game, when you have, as opponents, equally matched grandmasters who have narrowed it down to predictable lines of play, all sorts of other factors come into it. In his book, Anand speaks of how in cases he looks for little tells, just like poker players do. The difference is in the way an opponent breathes in places, a tightening of the shoulder muscles, a change in demeanor. Articulate and well-spoken, and possessed of a great and often wacky sense of humor, how bad can a guy be when his inspiration is Monty Python? Anand's book is a delight to read, at so many levels, as motivational lessons for winning, for chess buffs like me who worship the game, or as the autobiography of a world champion who has the gift of humility on his side. You don't need to know a whit about chess for this book to make sense. I first met Vishy Anand at the Rashtrapati Bhavan in New Delhi at the President of India's National Awards Ceremony. He was there to receive a Padma Shri, and he was a teenager. In response to something I said, he asked politely, Oh, you play chess? Yes, I replied, but not as well as you do. That was 30-something years ago. Anand went on to be a grandmaster and world champion, and I played chess with as much mediocrity as I did back then. But I spent the last couple of days completely engrossed in his book, and it is my privilege to be able to invite him here today as a guest on my show. Vishwanathan Anand, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. To begin with, let's talk about the human element of chess. Now, to quote you, you write, No matter what you might be feeling emotionally, being inscrutable at the board is a vital skill. So is playing chess like playing poker? In chess, the information is all contained in the chess board, in the sense there is no hidden information. Nonetheless, um, in reality, it is much closer to poker because um, the chess player is influenced by his opinion about what is happening. It may be inaccurate, but he's going to go with it. <laughs> and therefore, insight into that is critical uh, for planning your moves. If I know that my opponent is on the completely false track, it will influence uh, the moves I select. Equally, if I know that he's found the right way, or what I believe to be the right way, that has an influence over. Well. So you, I think there is considerable value to uh, keeping your emotions and thoughts to yourself. Writing in the New York Times in 1972, Richard Roberts said, There is a great deal of emotion. With some people, it is passion, which perhaps makes chess closer to love than to poker. Yes, but that is from the outside. And when the heat and dust of the battle have settled, in a sense, logic takes over again. But uh, to understand what happened, you have to get into the heads of the participants. And it's only what they feel. If one of them is angry, that's what's coming through. If one of them is in love, that's what's coming through. Uh, if some of them is caught, if one of them is caught in the the beauty of a game, love is coming through, not uh, logic. It is the main facet of human chess, as opposed to computer chess. But even the computer chess can be said to be the uh, the emotions of the programmer. <laughs> so <laughs> you can work this backwards. <laughs> so. First time I've heard that. Sure. You know, it is said that there is no element of chance in chess, just you and your opponent and your respective psychologies. So as a chess player, is your super ego in check or is it always in play? It is almost always in play. Uh, uh, it's a bit like telling someone you should try not to be biased. <laughs> <laughs> and then how do you go about it? In chess, we always try to play the best move. Uh, we try to go with the accurate evaluation of the position. We believe these are important uh, training methods to play better chess, you know, working to find these things. But um, anybody who's played the game for a long time will understand that uh, it's a failure to come even close to these uh, ideals that decides the results in everything. So 
it's hard to explain, for instance, why in one of my most success between my most successful tournament and one of my worst tournaments, I will struggle to explain the exact difference between how I was feeling. It's just my opponent in the in the one that went badly, my opponent seemed to uh, hit my weak spot much earlier. In the one that went well, they struggled to find it. But there was a weak spot. There was something I was worried they would do. And in the good ones, they never get drawn to it. In the bad ones, they get there immediately. It's, uh, there is this random element and you can never take it away. In terms of superego and ambition and confidence, I remember an interview that you gave to a magazine or a paper in Chennai many years ago. I believe this was when you were in your teens. Maybe you had just won the national or whatever tournament it was. I recall you saying, I'll first get my grandmaster norm and then who knows, maybe I'll try for the world championship. It was a fairly preposterous thing for a Madras or Indian kid to say at the time. It, it also set up a sort of excitement among chess enthusiasts that maybe you just had it in you. You were 17. What were you thinking? I don't know what I was thinking. In a sense, I, I used to phrase things in that way. And it seemed to me that you had to think you were on the way to the world title. It, but it's, it's not like I had ever analyzed my games, compared them to my peers and... If, if, Thought it wasn't a logical answer. I just thought I, I will try for the world championship. That much is clear. Whether I'll succeed is another story, but I will try for it. On the way, first let me get this grandmaster thing out of the way. The grandmaster title, though, felt much more realistic at that point because it was just one or two steps away. The world title, who knew? But it was something everyone did. I mean, I thought the whole point of a chess player was to try for the world title. But quite a few people have mentioned that even when I was younger, even 14, uh, 13, 14 that I used to give this answer that one day I'll become world champion. But it was never based on any objective belief. I just thought, if you don't believe that, then what's the point? Well, in hindsight, the point is that you had this ambition without apology. Now, in cricket, for instance, Kapil Dev is credited with being the guy who changed Indian cricket simply by suggesting that we should win every game. You weren't a grandmaster yet when you suggested that you were going to become a grandmaster and then the world champion. Now, Today's grandmasters in India, there have been a few since, right? They stand on your shoulders. I don't know which it was. I feel that my grandmaster title may have been the bigger one because that's the one that so many have followed. So now we have 75 grandmasters. And there's a bit of the snowball. I was the first. We got the second one three years later. Uh, and it slowly got to six grandmasters by 2000, I think. And uh, so the vast majority of, of our GMs have actually been produced in the last 10 years. And the vast majority of our grandmasters are quite young. But, uh, but yes, it was, it's hard to describe nowadays what a psychological barrier the grandmaster title was. In fact, the question which was asked then and has been asked, uh, the variant of it has been asked in the Olympics, which is, why can't India, India win a medal or win a gold medal? At some point, we would uh, look back on hockey and uh, this one uh, Olympic gold medal and say, you know, why, why can a nation of how many of a million cannot win a gold medal? And it's not like we're drowning in them now, but uh, we already have two gold medals. We have uh, several medals. You know, it doesn't feel preposterous to think it, but uh, at a time it was. In, maybe in 2002 or 2004, it still felt... Uh, you could get away with the explanation of we are not sporting. We are maybe it's our hygiene, maybe it's our diet, uh, maybe it's the shape of our body. You could get away with that kind of explanation. Now it sounds ridiculous to say it, but then, and uh, in in chess, it was a psychological barrier. But I went through it fairly quickly. There's a uh, in the book I of course cover this because it was a very important milestone. Yes, you do. Uh, and it took two years of failing before it it just happened. But what was surprising for me uh, was that it just happened. In effect, I had not realized that I had become a stronger player. And so I had not realized that it was now within my grasp. And then it just, uh, it seemed to flow effortlessly. And uh, to my credit, I was not uh, surprised. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You're talking about the year 2000s. I'm saying that it sounded preposterous in 1986. That's right. Absolutely. Now, speaking of shoulders and standing upon, you wrote... If juxtaposed, I consider my journey in the sport to be much easier than someone like Fisher's. In his time, he really had to give up everything to become a chess player. I didn't. How so? You know, when you decided to go professional, you chose not to get yourself a 
steady job or suffer the pulls and pressures of middle class to million families. I speak more of your internal pressure than whatever pressures parents of society may or may not have placed upon you. So what was your plan B? There was an official plan B, which is that I would continue to do my BCom. That was the pretense. But to be honest, even with the exchange rate at that time, it seemed to me that a, a grandmaster's uh, earnings were comparable to any job in India at that point. Uh, at that time, it seemed a grandmaster's life seemed like a very good deal. And I never seriously had a plan B. And that part about Bobby Fisher? When he uh, was playing, you could live in many... Uh, in the Eastern Bloc, in Warsaw Pact countries, because you would get some kind of state support for being a chess player, and uh, that was it. But there was no system of decent financial, um, uh, to- I mean, tournaments with attractive financial conditions and so on. The Western players often juggled multiple jobs and tried to play on the side. Um, and so we never had a thing. And Bobby was the one who changed that. Uh, he changed it. The moment it became incredibly lucrative for him, he stopped playing chess, which is crazy, but that's another story. But he's the one, most people feel that he's the one who fought for it and uh, insisted on it and uh, made it happen for the rest of us. Now, in your chapter on prep, you speak of Sweden's Ferdinand Hellers, and you wrote mm-hmm. that Sweden didn't have a Russian chess culture and he was self-driven. Now, when you started to tilt at your windmills, India didn't have a stable full of grandmasters either, none in fact. You drove yourself when the dominant a uh, chess country, Russia, had splendid ecosystems for the game. On page 123, you wrote, Russian cabbies will checkmate you with a smirk. In fact, it's not true. I have never met a cab driver who's that strong a player. <laughs> but uh, that was the myth. You felt you were going. And it's a bit the same in India. I'm sure the uh, anybody who lands in India feels that his cab driver can play a bit of cricket or something. I don't know what's the battle. but <laughs> Closer than you think. You know the uh, chess players, those hustlers in Washington Square Park in New York? Uh I I love playing with those guys. Anyway, this is just after you were in the news for something you had done. I can't remember which. And it was a Sunday, so I walk up to uh, one of those hustlers and ask for a game. He turns around, takes one look at me and goes, hell no. (laughs) That's the ultimate compliment, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) He thought I was wishy. (laughs) So moving forward, how did you uh, how did you prepare for the big leagues when you were self-taught? Did you uh, pull up Fisher? Did you learn Russian? Buy Russian chess books? Read Russian books? Uh, I I used to read Russian chess books. I learned. I figured out the alphabet. I did not learn to speak Russian. I figured out the alphabet, which means right. I could tell who was playing, who was white, and who was black. I pretty sure. soon learned uh, who had resigned, white or black. So that was also helpful. Okay. But I couldn't read anything else. There's nothing right. else I understood. But that was enough. It, you felt like you were getting secret information from a magical world or something. Manuel Aaron once said in an interview many, many years ago that the way to build chess champs is to teach kids a lot of openings and pit them with theory. Now, that's when I realized that I could never be a competitive chess player. <laughs> so did you pit yourself with theory? Yes, I, I I studied. In fact, I was hungry for theory because I had so little of it. It strikes me that I was actually kind of naive in the sense that whatever was published, I would believe it uh, fully. I, it, never, it never really fully sunk in that the other players were being uh, coy with their information. Uh, uh, so just releasing enough to be able to publish it, but not giving away too much and so on. But it was good enough because I was so good a player myself that I could take those little bits and then conjure up something on my own on the board. It gave me the confidence to go and sit on the board feeling and I'm not going to lose the game very fast. How how much does intuition figure in a game that is supposed to be entirely logical? Uh, it's your nose. There's There are the positions where you just feel one move. You feel it very strongly. You feel it should be the right move or you feel it's the wrong move. Um, and uh-huh. as anyone who... Uh, has studied the concept of bias will understand once you have your intuition, whether your intuition is influencing your calculation or your calculation is uh, feeding into your intuition is very hard to separate. Um, But as you get closer to the time control or you get into positions where you have little time, you have to depend more and more on your intuition. When you cannot solve a problem, you have to say, well, this is my gut feel. This is what I go with. And uh, Right. But information and uh, calculation are connected with each other. The more you work on your calculation, the better your intuition gets. So if you do a lot of work mm-hmm. on an area 
and then come back some months later and play, you'll find your intuition is giving you much better guesses. So neither is static. Both are developing and they're influencing each other. Now, is it true that grandmasters, even though they've stared at the board for a very long time, often make the move that they had thought of in the first few seconds? Yes. Um, the move you thought about in the first few seconds is probably a decent move. Unless there is some obvious failing, it's it happens quite often that uh, I... I think a move is good. I leave it for 10 minutes and uh, after 9 minutes and 45 seconds, it suddenly hits me, it loses a piece. That has happened. But more likely, uh, if your move doesn't fail pretty fast, uh, that's what your heart wants to play and your heart tends to trump your mind in this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that is fascinating, isn't it? And it leads me to believe that blitz games can be as deep as the longer versions. That is our modern understanding of it. Uh, Botvinnik Botvinnik used to say that uh, blitz is bad for you and it should be used only in moderation. As a, I mean, he seemed to think blitz was just the chessboard variation of having a drink with your buddies. Oh, really? Did he? When you play a lot of blitz, you, you realize that under pressure, what is it you actually remember and you don't remember? You, the details. I may think I've checked a line, but in blitz, something unexpected will happen. And then when I play 10 blitz games, afterwards I'm dying to go back and and think, uh, and put this order. And then later on, if I go over the structure many times, I, I, I really understand something better. And Blitz allows you to test a lot of crazy ideas. You, But this these crazy ideas then allow you to almost, uh, let's say, stress test your chess. No, I know this is a hackneyed question, but does any game stand out for you in your career? There are probably 10 or 15 that stand out, but... Um, there were a couple of games I played recently. Recently means in the last 15 years. <laughs> so um, Aronian in 2013 is the one I bring up very often because it was it was uh, almost identical in its patterns to one of the legendary games of chess played in 1907 by Rubinstein. So, you know, when you, when you get to be that close to a masterpiece, you, it kind of has a special effect. And that Blitz game that you played with Smirin... Uh, I can't not bring it up. It's a blitz game. You're on a Mm one-minute handicap. And uh, you took one minute and 34 seconds in the fourth move. You did win the game, but a minute and 34 seconds? What were you thinking? You know, it's funny. Um, I had completely forgotten about that game. And it didn't seem to be that significant. It seemed to me that I had a mental, not a blackout, but I had a phase where I was just mentally blank for a while. And I snapped out of it after a minute and a half. I didn't think it was such a big deal. But then what happened was um, many years later, without me realizing it, this thing became a kind of thing on YouTube. And so, so the algorithm the algorithm would throw up this one thing often and everyone found it funny. Also because there was some legendary commentary where uh, this man, Maurice Ashley, who's a, a very big commentator, he was, and uh, Daniel King was uh, there as well. He said, what is Anand doing? What, and Ashley and King, yeah. Ashley and King. I think it was Ashley and King. But anyway, King Daniel King would say, but Vishy, come on, make a move. What are you doing, I think? And uh, I myself was obli- oblivious to that effect. Okay, but what was Smirin thinking at the time? I have not I have not asked Smirin. Uh, I should ask Smirin at some point what he thought of this whole mess. Because his perspective is missing. What was he thinking when I was thinking for a minute and a half? That's a good point. I, you, I never got around to asking him. <laughs> it's uh, it's very funny. And the commentary was on steroids. Yes. And you remember this position? For our listeners, I'm showing Anand the position after move 36 in the 1995 World Championship in New York against Kasparov. You'll see why it's significant. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember it well. This is my game with Kasparov where I should have played uh, two before rather than allowing him to. That makes that still makes me angry, that one, because I was so winning in that. If I had done this, I would probably have beaten him and uh, it would have changed my life. Could you explain? Because he was a difficult opponent for me for the next 10 years. But if I had won that game, he would have been less difficult for me because it was confidence, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I was uh, reminded of it more recently when I was playing one of those internet online uh, guess the best move things. Ah, okay. And you know what? I guessed Rook H4. And the website says, no, but that's what Vichy played. Oh, God. (laughs) Good enough for Vichy, good enough for me. Okay, you first won the title in 2000 and then in 2007. 
I won't bother you with the banality of uh, which is the sweet of victory. Lots have been said about it. But in either case, describe your feelings mm-hmm. on being right on top. How did it feel in the hotel room that evening? 2000 felt brilliant because uh, the title had eluded me on three attempts and I'd finally made it and so on. But it had already happened a few days before. Ah, ah yes, I get it. The thing is, uh, it's not like you win in a shot. Mostly you're relieved you've completed the job without botching it. That's maybe the dominant emotion. Then there was the feeling of celebration when you come back home and everybody is celebrating, congratulating you. You get invited here and there. You go to see the president. Sure. That that phase always seems to me, I feel like I'm someone, it's happening somewhere else and I'm standing there uh, like a hologram and observing it. That's the feeling you have. Um, you cannot say why, but you, by that point... Uh, you have moved on and you're enjoying the fact that it means something to somebody else, but it has stopped to me, stopped meaning something to you. And now in your chapter on you're becoming an elder of the profession, in uh, the chapter titled Staying Alive, inspired by the Bee Gees, no doubt, you write, I can't recall the first time I felt old. Yes, I, I've gone through umpteen school reunions and... Uh, oh <laughs> Especially with your classmates uh, having a school reunion, you feel 15 again. And everyone looks at you and, who are these bunch of old guys? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Has growing older affected your cognitive skills in any way as a chess player? I used to make blunders. I still make blunders. Uh, I guess I make them for different reasons now. You think you were a stronger player before, but what it is is you're actually interpreting your results from earlier and thinking I was better. I nonetheless have a sense now that uh, the center of gravity in chess has shifted towards youth heavily, thanks to computers. Right. Because I see all my people of my age cohort struggling and Mm -hmm. are working Mm -hmm. much harder or the ones who are not adapting, falling behind. And so you see, see certain patterns and you realize this is what must be happening. But it'll take a huge amount of data analysis to make make some laws out of it. Um, if you see what I mean. Right, um, right. And over time, I realize I'm, I'm just making blunders. There are things that used to be effortless for me that are being harder. And even allowing for the fact that um, our understanding of the game has advanced to the point that nothing is simple anymore. Uh, I still feel that chess is harder than it used to be or less fun than it used to be. Now, it can be other things. It can be that you think more about family. Uh, maybe everyone has a, a ceiling of the number of chess results they can get excited about before the brain moves on. It could be multiple things, but undoubtedly there's an effect. And again, you go back to the data point. You look at the list and you realize the youngsters are all crawling all over it. And the older players are getting rarer. And you, you, you then conjure up exp- explanations for that. But I think it's fairly consistent. That's really very well said. Well, anyway, congratulations on the new Federation appointment. What do you have to do in this gig? Uh, I will have to attend uh, one General Assembly every year uh, and go to multiple council meetings where there's a lot of work. And uh, I get a chance to enact some of my own priorities. So if I want to bring uh, get FIDE more into chess in India or uh, push women's chess a bit more, um, uh, help enact rules. I can interact with various commissions and it gives me a kind of institutional role to affect that rather than being someone from the outside writing a letter saying, can can this happen or that happen? That's fantastic. And I know we discussed this off the air, but let me ask you on the air, how's the academy coming along? Very nicely. So um, it's going very well. We set a target of how do we get a lot of our people to 2,700, you know, how do we make our presence felt at the top of world chess? And uh, two of our youngsters have already cracked it, maybe two or three years ahead of schedule. So it's, uh, it, feels, it feels very, very good right now. And who are your biggest success stories? Let's say by, sh- by purely numbers, Gukesh would stand out. So the three of them who are the strongest right now by one measure or the other is Pragnananda, Arjun Erigaisi, and uh, Gukesh. As I mentioned earlier, they have your shoulders to stand on, which is good for them. Now, before I let you go, I simply have to ask you this question. Can I play a game with you? Sure. That's generous. Thank you. Where do, where do you want to play? Oh, I thought we'd just call out the moves. Okay, we can do that, yeah. Do you want to play black, white? Oh, I thought if I played white, I'd have a good chance of beating you. Well, I'll, I'll just have to run the gauntlet. <laughs> <laughs> You're being very kind. All right. All right? Yeah. E4. Uh, C5. Knight F3. Uh, D6. D4. C takes D4. Knight takes Knight f6. Knight c3. a6. 
bishop e3. Knight g4. Queen d2. Uh, knight takes e3. Queen takes. Okay, uh, g6. Bishop c4. Bishop g7. Knight in d to e2. Castles. Castles, queen side. Uh, knight c6. Bishop d3. Uh, Bishop d7. a3. Rook to c8. King b1. Uh, b5. Knight a2. Uh, rook to b8. <clears throat> Rah. Hindsight is twenty twenty. All right, here goes nothing. Rook d2. Okay. b4. a takes b4. Knight takes b4. Knight takes b4. Rook takes knight. Knight c3. Uh, bishop takes c3. But of course, I resign. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for this. Thank you. Yeah, you could have played c3, not knight c3. But... Now you tell me. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Well, more part your elbow on everything that you're doing with FIDE, with the Academy. And let me say that the nation owes you hugely. First of all, for being a little kid from Madras that struck out alone into the world and made it a world champion. And secondly, for everything you're doing to create the next Indian world champions. So, Vishy Anand, thank you so much for being my guest on The Literary City. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And that was the amazing former world chess champion, Vishwanathan Anand, the author of Mind Master, Winning Lessons from a Champion's Life. There are links in the podcast description as to where you can buy that book and other books. And of course, a description about him, not that he needs one. And I'll be back with What's That Word? That fun segment where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time, but never stop to think about. But that after this segment. Fans of the TV show Mad Men may know the gimlet as Betty Draper's favorite drink, but Betty likely knew it from Raymond Chandler's 1953 novel, The Long Goodbye. It's really easy to make a classy gimlet. Pour in 60 milliliters of Hapusha gin. Add 30 milliliters of lime juice. Shake on ice until well chilled. Garnish with a lime. Then settle back and let that smooth and suave hapusha do its thing. Hapusha is made from juniper berries from the Himalayas. Juniper berries are hard to get, but it's easy to buy a bottle of hapusha. And I'm back with What's That Word? And to help me with it is my co-host, and she loves introducing herself. Go ahead, do your thing. Hello, my name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A. How's it going today? Hey, another great interview. I had great fun listening to your interview with Vishy Anand. Thank you. I had even more fun doing it. I know. And you played a game with him? <laughs> I let him off the hook gently, you know. <laughs> yeah, clearly. I, I'm kidding, of course. Well, it was super nice of him to indulge me. Yeah, and how did you do in this game? Oh, I played with the insightfulness of a great heap of boiled cabbage. <laughs> oh, come on now. No, no, I usually play a great deal better than I did. But the mood of the moment got me, and I lost my religion very early in the game, you know. But I didn't want to waste Vishy's time. This is not some random opponent on chess.com. But listen, <laughs> it's beyond ridiculous for me to talk about how I played against Vishy Anand. So let's move on. Right. What's your chess.com rating? Well, 1550 at best. Is that good? Uh, what is that in P day or ELO ranking? I really have no clue. I tried looking it up once, but I got very confused. Too many people saying too many things. It didn't matter to me. Yeah. But this was fun. Certainly was. Okay, P with an A, what's that word? In your interview with Anand, at one point mm -hmm. you referred to his quest for champion status. You uh -huh. referred to him tilting at windmills. <laughs> yes, that's right. Tilting at windmills. You know the meaning, of course. Yeah, so very briefly, and to be able to discuss this at some length, mm -hmm. tilting at windmills means going after an imagined enemy or an enemy that can cannot be easily identified. Perfect. So let's dive in. 
starting from the book Don Quixote. Okay, yes, yes. The origin of the phrase is from the book Don Quixote, written in 1604 by Miguel de Cervantes, or its original title, The Ingenious Knight of, of La Mancha. You know? Wait, wait, so, wait, quickly. That whole pronunciation uh, bit, do it again? Uh, ah, okay. Uh, Don Quixote. So, in Spanish, the X is pronounced like an H. Right. So, Don Quixote. Right. Okay, <laughs> by the way, funnily, I heard a Swedish guy say that the X in Spanish is pronounced like a J. <laughs> because in Sweden, the J is pronounced like a Y. So, <laughs> anyway, in the book, Don uh, Quixote. Wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. The author's name now, you said that differently too. All right, Miguel de Cervantes. Well, again, in Spanish, U-E, the U-E in Miguel, the U-E is pronounced with just the E sound. And in uh, Cervantes, the V in Spanish is pronounced like a B, a B as in Bravo. So it's Miguel de Cervantes. Ah, I think I now crave a chilled Miguel Cerveza. <laughs> the beer, <laughs> right. Well, sorry to flatten your froth, but that Z or Z in Spanish is pronounced with a soft, very soft, just a touch of TH sound. You know, like a lisp. Lisping? Well, lisping, you know, softly. <laughs> Antonio Banderas does it better than you. Uh, maybe, but you go ask Banderas if he played chess with Bishi Anand any time recently. <laughs> okay, fine, you win. No, I lost. <laughs> anyway, back to tilting at windmills. Don Quixote was a knight who wanted to defeat injustice through chivalry. So, you know, so he sets off on this rather underdefined quest with his squire or sidekick. Sancho Panza. At one point, he sees some windmills in the distance and he says to Sancho Panza these words, Fortune is guiding our affairs better than we ourselves could have wished. Do you see over yonder, friend Sancho, thirty or forty hulking giants? I intend to do battle with them and slay them. With their spoils we shall begin to be rich, for this is a righteous war." and the removal of so foul a brood from off the face of the earth is a service God will bless. What giants? asked Sancho Panza. Those you see over there, replied his master, with their long arms, some of them have arms well nigh two leagues in length. And then Sancho Panza informs him that these are windmills used to mill grain, and uh, you can read the rest in the book. No spoilers here. <laughs> Let me guess. The butler did it, right? Dang, you got it right the first time. <laughs> anyway, the first known use of this metaphor came in the, in the 17th century when John Cleveland published The Character of a London Diurnal in 1644. In it, he wrote, The Quixotes of this age fight with the windmills of their own heads. How interesting. But what's a diurnal? It's something between a diary and a journal. Ah, and nothing to do with diurnal as in daily? I'm not sure. Actually, that's an interesting one. I, I will look it up, but that's etymology for another day, right? Anyway, so this quirky behavior of Don Quixote led to the expression being quixotic. Right, yes. I had forgotten that connection. But tell me, spoilers aside, did Don Quixote listen to Sancho Panza? <laughs> no, he didn't. He tilted his lance forward and charged the windmills. And of course, the windmill won. <laughs> and uh, this, this led to the phrase, tilting at windmills, not only standing for a fruitless quest or effort, but also one that will cost you dearly. Oh, poor guy. Yeah, and by the way, the expression, at full tilt, is also derived from a knight in a joust, tilting his lance and rushing his opponent. So the reference to Vichy Anand's tilting at windmills was tongue-in-cheek. Yes, of course. I mean, I meant to illustrate that for others, a teen, teenage Anand talking about winning the world title while he was yet getting his grandmaster Norm must have seemed like he was tilting at windmills. Right, yeah. Well, you know, there's a funny story also about Anand. Yeah, I like those. <laughs> Well, once on a train, Vishy Anand met a man who, without knowing who he was, 
quickly advised him that chess as a career was a mug's game unless he happened to be Vishwanath Anand. <laughs> really? And did mm-hmm. Vishy let on? No, he says he didn't. <laughs> okay, now for that hapusha. Also not pronounced like it's written. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> So wherever it is that you listen to podcasts, just make sure that you hit that subscribe button or whatever they call it and never miss another episode of The Literary City. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening and see you again next Wednesday.